Regarding the character, the khuluq, the conduct of the Prophet his behavior towards others. <coughs> With regards to the character, the khuluq of the Prophet this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions explicitly in the Quran. He says, Inna kala ala that you have been blessed with greatest conduct, the greatest character. And this is why we see that the conduct and the character of the Prophet وسلم, is actually used as an example um, throughout the world. The Prophet وسلم, has become an example of good conduct and good character. And it is extremely difficult for anyone to consume and to actually exhaust all the ahadith regarding the conduct and the character of the Prophet وسلم, um, and you have you find many uh, anthologies of our hadith where there's extensive sort of chapters on the conduct and the khuluq of the Prophet وسلم. And so for this reason, uh, Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah ta'ala, he selected 15 ahadith in this chapter just to give a glimpse and an example of what the conduct and the character of the Prophet وسلم, was like. So you'll see different aspects of the conduct and the character of the Prophet within those ahadiths. <coughs> this first hadith is narrated by the son of Sayyidina Zaid bin Thabit ta'ala. And he says that a group of people came to him, came to Sayyidina Zaid ta'ala and said, Narrate to us the traditions of the Messenger of Allah. You know, his mannerisms, what was he like, what did he do, how to behave, what his conduct was like. And so he said that, you know, what can I narrate to you? And meaning that this isn't really something that I can explain to you in a matter of a few <coughs> sentences or a few minutes. Now, this is the sense that we get from his expression of what can I narrate to you or um, you know, how, uh, how do I tell you about the conduct and the character of the Prophet وسلم, um, which is something that it, you know, extends to every walk of life and he says that I was the neighbor of the Prophet the reason for stating that as well is that he would have had a chance to see the conduct of the Prophet in detail and repeatedly and sort of over and over again and so there would have been a great amount that he could narrate 
and he says that when the divine revelation was revealed to the Prophet وسلم, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the wahi he was one of those who are referred to as the katibs, the, the scribes of, of the wahi, of the revelations and so the, he says that it was often me uh, whom the Prophet وسلم, would send for reason being that he lived uh, in sort of, uh, he lived close to the Prophet وسلم, not necessarily uh, because of any other reason we do know that there are other scribes and other uh, Qatibs as well who were instructed to write down the Wahi as it was revealed amongst them Sayyidina Usman, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina uh, Ubay and Umir Mu'awiyah, Sayyidina Umir Mu'awiyah, Khalid bin Sayyid and Sayyidina Hamzala, Ala Akrami, Aban bin Sayyid Bidwanullah Ta'ala alayhim ajma'in you know amongst them just a few names that these were the scribes who were instructed to write down the Wahi but he would often be sent for because he <coughs> lived close to the Prophet وسلم, and he was a neighbor of the Prophet and he says that when we would mention the affairs of this world he would mention them with us so the Prophet وسلم, was not a gathering that was solely focused on the hereafter rather when the Sahaba spoke about affairs of this world and this is something that we've already covered in the chapter regarding the speech of the Prophet وسلم, um, this has been mentioned and the fact that this was one of the reasons why the, the Sahaba were able to have such a close relationship with the Prophet because you know, if, if the Prophet وسلم, remained reserved and remained silent and spoke only of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of the hereafter and the matters of the religion it would have been difficult for the Sahaba to actually relate to the Prophet وسلم, and to build a relationship with him he lived amongst them and so he shared their, their, sort of their joy and their sorrow he shared their worries and he shared with them uh, the, his life of, within the community and so they were able to develop with the Prophet وسلم, a very strong relationship and we see different aspects of this you see elements of friendship in there where you see you know, people coming and confiding to the Prophet وسلم, seeking advice from him telling their problems to the Prophet وسلم, using him as an arbitrator you know, between uh, two parties who may have sort of uh, fallen out with each other uh, asking the Prophet وسلم, for help in many different departments we see you know those elements but then at the same time we see uh, the reverence that the sahaba you know had for the prophet وسلم, the respect and the honor that they gave him it is unmatched <coughs> and so it's quite complicated uh, but very uh, uh, sort of beautiful and very deep relationship that they had with the prophet وسلم, and this was part of the reason that the Prophet uh, he himself he initiated uh, sort of this uh, a, this sort of relationship by allowing them to speak of such things and joining with them. And so he says that when the affairs of this world were mentioned, the Prophet وسلم, would also talk about uh, worldly affairs. And when we would mention the affairs of the afterlife, he would mention them with us. And when we would mention food, he would mention it with us. All of this is what I can narrate to you of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is what uh, <coughs> Sayyidina Zayd radiallahu ta'ala he says. One other thing to mention there is that when we say matters and affairs of the dunya, often something that comes to mind you might think is uh, things which are useless. You know, um, which is why, for example, um, there's a prohibition of talking about the dunya within the masjid or talking about worldly affairs when doing wudu and things like this. We associate worldly affairs with something maybe different or sometimes we may associate them with something that is um, not really uh, befitting the Prophet you need to be careful to separate that meaning when talking about the Prophet you need to be careful in your mind when you say that he would join them in matters of the uh, talking, discussing affairs of the dunya, of the world you need to separate those two notions in your mind 
Because when you're talking about the Prophet وسلم, again, within the dunya, the Prophet وسلم, is talking about affairs of the dunya which will support them to better their affairs of the deen, of the religion. And these are constructive discussions you know, about elements of the dunya which are necessary. For example, many of them, um, agriculture was their livelihood. And so they, they would come and they would talk to the Prophet ﷺ, they would discuss, they would take his opinion on, on, on certain things and they would sort of take advice from the Prophet ﷺ on some of their agricultural affairs and so on. Again, with food as well, it wasn't a matter of indulgence. You know, it wasn't like, for example, when we sit over a meal and we discuss the food, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be in that same capacity. With the Prophet ﷺ, it was often advice. The Prophet ﷺ would say you should eat this kind of thing because it has this benefit. You know, we've covered all of that in the chapter regarding the food. The Prophet ﷺ, how he spoke about vinegar. And he said, any household that has vinegar has no need for a condiment. You know, it's not a, uh, they have food. If they have vinegar, they have food. The Prophet وسلم, uh, instructed and encouraged the Sahaba to use olive oil. And he mentioned the benefits of it and, and things like this. So the speech of the Prophet وسلم, in its nature was truthful and beneficial, whether it was concerning the dunya or the deen. So that's something that you need to sort of uh, be cautious of and separate within your minds when talking about that. And so the gist of what you can understand from that hadith is, is that Sayyidina Zayd and he's saying that there were so many different aspects to the conduct of the Prophet He's telling them, those people who ask the question, he's saying to them uh, that you need to be specific. You need to ask me what you want to ask about the Prophet Because if you ask me a general question like they did, that tell us something about the Prophet there is too much there for me to tell you all of it. You need to be more specific. And then he mentions his relationship, saying that he was a neighbor, he was one of the scribes, and that this was what happened in the gatherings of the Prophet And as if to ask them, what aspect of the Prophet's life or his conduct or his character they wish to learn about. <coughs> the next hadith is narrated by Sina Amr bin Asr. He says that the Messenger of Allah would speak to the most evil of people in order that he may soften their hearts. He would speak to me in such a manner that I would begin to think that I was the best of people. And we've seen this. You know, we've, uh, you, you've heard glimpses of this in previous chapters, just in, in, the, in the chapter before. The long <coughs> which is narrated from <coughs> say, Imam uh, Hassan ta'ala, about the, the description of the Prophet by his uncle. And that's a very lengthy hadith. We went through that in the last chapter. You heard about how one of the descriptions of the Prophet was when he disliked someone or something, he turned away from it. He would deprive it of his attention. But when he was engaged in conversation with someone, he gave them his fullest attention. Now, it wasn't a matter of. And, and, you know, naturally, you will know people like this as well. I do as well. And. You know, some people have a habit of not paying 100% attention when you're talking to them. And if you're anything like me, you will know how excruciatingly annoying that can be. You know, when you're having to say half of your sentence and then begin again from the beginning and start again. And it's not the foundations of a, you know, a healthy conversation. And this was not the affair of the Prophet He would devote his complete attention to whomever he was speaking to. And such that every individual felt, you know, the Prophet Wasallam's attention towards people was such that whoever earned this attention of the Prophet Wasallam, he began to feel that he was the most valued in the eyes of the Prophet Wasallam. This is how attentive he was towards them. And this is uh, partly what this hadith is about, what the, you, you'll get a sense of this from what's coming up. And so, um, this is something that you should try to develop within you, that when, when you are having a conversation, um, you know, listen as well as 
sort of uh, give your input in that conversation, listen attentively. Right down to the fact that the Prophet وسلم, and <clears throat> I've done this as a practical with some of my <clears throat> with my younger students walking around the classroom. I've, 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 I've stuck my hand out to shake hands with one of them and I've held on to his hand and you can imagine after a few seconds he started getting a little agitated and so mm -hmm. on. And then when he eventually pulled his hand away, I explained that this was the manner of the Prophet ﷺ. When he shook hands with somebody, he took a hold of their hands and he would not let go until the other person let go. <coughs> Excuse me. So th this, these kind of things, they, they show you what kind of a, a, a character the Prophet ﷺ had that giving people his attention. Just to trust. Um, yeah, I was going to say that on an individual basis, in the same manner, I mean, the, the mannerisms of the Prophet ﷺ speaking, obviously, uh, when speaking to a crowd, one of the things about the Prophet ﷺ was, and uh, we know this from uh, the khutbah, the sermon during the, uh, the farewell hajj, which was a, a gathering of you know, uh, extensive proportions. Yet even the people who were furthest away from the Prophet ﷺ heard him as clearly as those who were stood very close to him. And obviously, um, public speaking uh, was something that was part of not only the nature of the Prophet ﷺ, part of his duties in propagating the message. And so those skills, you know, we have elements of where the Prophet ﷺ used gestures and you know, used his hands to gesture with and would focus his attention to all the gathering and, you know, equally and so on. So that you know, if, if his attention wasn't focused specifically in a gathering, it wouldn't specifically be focused on one individual unless he was addressing him. It would be, you know, it would be upon the whole sort of gathering. So th this is what we're talking about. So he says that um, he would speak to me in such a manner that I would begin to think that I was the best of the people. I thought, and, and look at this, this was my <coughs> criteria for judging who was the best of people. This all, it give, this, we can learn many things, not just directly from the text, but from actually understanding the text, that the criteria for the Sahaba of judging who was the best of people was to see who earned the most attention from the Prophet and because he felt that he had earned you know, a lot of attention from the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ would pay a lot of attention to him, he says, I began to think that I was the best of people. I must be the best of all the people if the Prophet ﷺ is devoting so much attention to me and he's sort of giving me so much time and attention and so on. And so one day, uh, this thought crept into his mind and he asked the Prophet ﷺ, he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, am I better than Abu Bakr? And the Prophet ﷺ replied, No. He, he asked, Am I better or Abu Bakr? And the Prophet ﷺ replied, He said, Abu Bakr. <coughs> then he asked, Ya Rasulullah, Am I better or Umar? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Umar. Then he asked, Ya Rasulullah, Am I better or Usman? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Usman. So all three times the Prophet ﷺ spoke the truth and told him clearly. You know who was uh, senior and superior in in rank and, and you know in, in other respects as well. And so he says that after I asked the message of Allah, and he told me the truth, he told me you know what was true. I started to think that maybe I shouldn't have asked. And I began to wish that I had not asked him. There's different ways of interpreting that. One one thing that immediately comes to mind is possibly wanting to hold on to that sensation that he was. You know, he felt that he was the best of people. He'd, by asking, he'd lost that, and you know, it was now clear that he wasn't. Um, and another reason, possibly, may have been that um, you know, there was a, the, the, this may be considered as a glimpse of you know, uh, wanting to hear one's own praise or something like that. That he, sh he shouldn't really have been focusing on this aspect that he was better than other, or that he was the best. Of well, he maybe should have simply been focusing on the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was paying such attention to him. There's another very fine detail in this hadith regarding uh, the aqidah of the Ahl-Sunnah al-Jama'ah. 
the, the status of you know, the seniority and superiority after the Prophet Because remember, he's asking, in his mind he says that I thought, I began to think that I was the best of people. And then so he picked, in his mind, he picked the one person whom he thought was the most superior after the Prophet And so he asked about him first. He said, am I better than Abu Bakr? And the Prophet said, no. And so then he asked about the next person that he thought in his mind was more superior, which was Sayyidina Umar. And so he said, uh, am I better than Umar? And the Prophet said, no. And then Sayyidina Usman. So he started to, sort of in his view, uh, he started from the top and worked his way down. Which does tell us that even amongst the Sahaba, this is only, you know, we learn this uh, through indications from the actual text. There's very, very clear evidence within the text that within the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, the companions were very clear on the fact that they believed and they acknowledged that the most senior amongst them after the Prophet ﷺ was Sayyidina Abu Bakr, then Sayyidina Umar, then Sayyidina Usman, and then you know, the, the rest of the Sahaba and, and so on. So uh, this, is, this, this is the Aqeedah of the Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the order of superiority and seniority is the same as the sequence of Khilafah. <coughs> Sayyidina Abu Bakr and then Sayyidina Umar, then Sayyidina Uthman, then Sayyidina Ali and so um, that's something that is uh, sort of, uh, that can be derived from that hadith. It's very, very plain and very clear. It doesn't really need a lot of uh, sort of thought put into it. And we have clear verbal evidence from the Sahaba of this in other ahadith as well. <coughs> Moving on, Sayyidina Anas bin Malik ta'ala, he narrates the next hadith and he says that I served the Messenger of Allah for 10 years. He never said, oh, you know, he, he never showed any expression of uh, being upset with me. And this is the, you know, this is one of the very smallest uh, gestures that one can make, is just to, to, to say, oh, uh, why? Uh, and he says that the Prophet never, when I did something, the Prophet never said to me, why did you do that? And when I didn't do something, he never said to me, why, did, why didn't you do that? So, never on anything I did did the Prophet say, why did you do that? And anything I left out, the Prophet never said to me, why didn't you do that? The Messenger of Allah was from the most beautiful of people in character. I never felt any fabric or silk softer than the palm of the Prophet Nor have I ever smelt a fragrance sweeter than the perspiration of the Prophet I have never smelt any fragrance more beautiful, any musk, and any musk or any fragrance more beautiful than the, the perspiration of Rasulullah Again, there's a lot that can be commented upon within that hadith. This is not an exaggeration of any kind. You know, this thing about the, the perspiration of the Prophet this is not in any manner of speaking an exaggeration. And the Sahaba used physically, they collected and used the perspiration of the Prophet for the purpose of fragrance. We know those narrations. Sayyidina Anas bin Malik ta'ala and his mother, Umm Salam radiallahu anha, you know, she's one of she's the narrator of one of those ahadith where the Prophet she herself collected the beads of perspiration of the Prophet sallallahu body. So this is not in any manner of speaking an exaggeration. And we see that the Prophet never in, in a sense, he's been never telling off uh, Sayyidina Anas bin Malik and we see this is, uh, this is the sign of a, an extremely, extremely patient and wise person. And who, you know, who's more patient and more wise than the Prophet Sallallahu um, amongst people. And so we see, and you know, the thought comes to mind. If the Prophet never said to him, why did you do this? Never said to him, why didn't you do this? 
we also know that the, the, the best mu'allim in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how did he teach? How did he, uh, you know, how did he nurture these Sahaba, especially these who were children, you know, who were children and who grew up with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did he then influence them if he never said, why, did, why are you doing this or why didn't you do this, why did you do this? The fact of the matter is, we find that the manner of teaching of the Prophet ﷺ was very different. I think it would take a, a, a completely separate course to actually look at parenting in light of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, I just want to give you as an example, remind you of one piece from the Shamail that you've already uh, heard previously. That you know, when someone came, a child came to the Prophet ﷺ whilst he was eating. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, "Sit down, read Bismillah, eat with your right hand, and eat from in front of you." You know, this was the manner of teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. Didn't allow him to sit down and then begin eating <coughs> and stop him and ask him, "Why did you not read Bismillah? Or why are you not eating with your right hand? Or why are you not eating in front of you?" And the, 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 the method of the Prophet ﷺ was that with great love and affection he would teach prior to them actually, you know, and, and if something like that happened he would overlook <coughs> it and he would use, you know, he, he would uh, tell them in an appropriate manner at an appropriate time what the correct, uh, sort of, what the correct method should be. This is part of the, the parenting of, you know, the, that we learn from the Prophet you know, um, when I say parenting, obviously uh, these were the you know, khadims of the Prophet servants, they were serving the Prophet they were children who came to the Prophet in his madlis and so on. But still from the manner in which he dealt with them, we can pick up as you know, parenting skills from them and how we should, so we should behave towards children. <coughs> And part of that is also an element of that was that if, if someone did something, missed something, forgot something, the bottom line was that the Prophet ﷺ, and we know this from other ahadith as well, is that the, the belief there was that this is as Allah intended it. It was intended by Allah to happen in this matter, and that's it. And it's very, you know, it, it becomes easier to be patient. Obviously, I'm not. One of the things about the khuluq of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, let me you know, I'll tell you this as well. It's, it's it's just suddenly came into my mind as I was saying that, and, and Alhamdulillah uh, for that, praise to Allah subhanahu wa taala. That this is very important. The khuluq and the conduct of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What is the definition of khuluq? The definition, you know, uh, of khuluq. This is the Arabic word for conduct and character. The definition of khuluq is something that is good, a good habit, a good manner, a good uh, etiquette of a person where he does this without having to exert himself. So in other words, it's part of the nature of that person. This is very, very important that all of these things, it never took effort from the Prophet this is part of his nature. It happened naturally. And so, when I say it makes it easier, I mean for us, it makes it easier to be patient. When you grasp onto this belief firmly that everything happens in accordance with the will of Allah subhanahu wa And that does make it easier to then be patient when you accept that this is how Allah intended for it to happen. And so that's part of that as well. There's one thing which I want to mention here. This hadith is often referred to as the hadith of Musafaha. How did Sayyidina Anas bin Malik know that the palms of the Prophet were more soft than silk to the touch is when shaking hands with the Prophet And so we know that you know, the Prophet Regarding his fragrance as well, it's mentioned that when he would shake hands with somebody, that person's hands would smell of musk. 
and of, of the most beautiful fragrance. And so Sayyidina Anas bin Malik, here he mentions the touch or the sensation of touching the palms of the Prophet How was this? It was when shaking hands with the Prophet And Musafaha means a handshake. So this hadith is known as the hadith of Musafaha. Not for that reason though. For the reason that once when Sayyidina Anas bin Malik was, was telling this hadith, one of the students or one of those who were listening, one of the members of that gathering, stood up and he said, he requested to say that to Malik and he said, I want to, I, I want to have the honor of shaking that hand, which had the honor of shaking the hand of Rasulullah mm -hmm. So he went up to say that to Malik and he shook his hand, simply for the fact that his hand had been blessed with the honor of touching the Prophet sallallahu hand and then one, you know, someone did that you know, one of his students asked him the same request and then one of his students and this is something that has continued believe it or not over 14 centuries and there's even you know people have a, a sunnah a chain of narration you know like you have for a hadith that I heard from such a person and he heard people have a sunnah of how many people in between them and the Prophet sallallahu hand so, you know, I, I shook hands with him and he shook hands with him and eventually someone, one of the Sahaba, one of the companions who shook hands with the Prophet And for this reason, this has become known as uh, the Hadith of Musafah. The next Hadith is also narrated by Sayyidina Anas bin Malik He says there was a man, there was once a man who had traces of yellow saffron upon his clothing whilst in the presence of the Messenger of Allah. It was from his noble character not to openly criticize anyone for something he disliked. So when the man stood up and left the gathering, he said to the people, it would have been better for you to tell him to leave this yellow saffron, this yellow dye, not to use it. You might think there why the Prophet did not directly stop someone from doing something. First of all, this is not a matter of halal and haram. It's a matter of, you know, better being, you know, it's better not to have that. Not that it's not, uh, it's forbidden or that it's haram. But it's better if he didn't have it. So this is a matter of uh, preference, if you like, or a matter of istihbab of, uh, you know, something optional. And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to the Sahaba, you know, it would have been better if you told him not to, uh, to use that dye. Why not directly? Well, the fact is that when it was something evidently against the Sharia, something haram, something clearly, critically against the Sharia, there was no one more harsh, more strict than the Prophet And this is coming up in this very chapter, Hadith, of that nature from Sayyidina Aisha anha, where she says that the Prophet had the best of conduct and character um, yet you know he never got angry for himself ever but there was no one who got more angry than the Prophet وسلم, when the limits of Allah were broken and so this was not one of those matters it wasn't a, a, a matter of halal and haram and for that reason secondly one of the great wisdoms behind doing this, and this was a habit of the Prophet ﷺ, and this is often how he addressed issues that were non-critical, that were not of you know, the category of being halal and haram. The way the Prophet ﷺ, uh, addressed those issues was indirectly like this, and then the Sahaba would go and tell those people what to do and how to you know, rectify that situation and so on. And with doing that, the Prophet ﷺ saved them from the possibility. I want to give you an example of one person who was eating with his left hand and the Prophet ﷺ came across him and said to him, eat with your right hand. His response was, I can't. Even though he was fully able to do so, you know, out of arrogance, he simply said, I can't. And the Prophet ﷺ said, well, let it be so. And it was for the rest of his life that person was he lost the use of his left hand, he was never able to, his right hand, he was never able to raise his right hand to his mouth again 
And so the Prophet ﷺ, by doing this, this was an act of compassion in that, you know, just in the heat of the moment it is possible or just by some, you know, some strange happening. If the Prophet ﷺ told one of the companions not to do something and he questioned, this would be critical for his faith and his Iman. And so the Prophet ﷺ didn't do this. He saved them this possibility of falling into that hardship. And Yeah. Is that the same kind of context where when he said it, that it became that way? No, I mean, that was, that would be classified as, as the punishment for that person uh, sort of objecting to what the Prophet uh, instructed him to do. That was an objection, it was out of arrogance, and this was his, you know, this could be seen as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishing him for his uh, act of questioning the decision of the Prophet But it would be, to do that would, would have critical implications on someone's faith and their Iman. So generally the Prophet avoided this situation by not publicly or not openly or directly addressing these issues and addressing them indirectly. Now, that's what some of the ulama and the commentators have mentioned. Something that just came into my own mind, and this is a personal thought, is also that with respect to the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba were extremely, extremely cautious and sensitive. And I reference this to a hadith, uh, a very lengthy hadith of Sina Qabin uh, Malik ta'ala, when he was left behind from the book, and how you know for 40 days uh, there was no. So the Prophet instructed all of the companions to stop talking to those people, there were three of them, and how that affected those companions. Right? The two who were slightly older, they just simply sat and cried. Something, you know, this is some if you love somebody, then it is very, very difficult to bear their sort of uh, upset or their being unhappy or not liking something that you've done, um, you know, it can be very difficult to bear. And, you know, one of, something that came into my mind was this was also compassionate on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ for that reason as well. That, you know, simply, for example, if this had been stated directly, that person may have then sort of, uh, you know, he may not have been able to handle the fact that he'd done something that the Prophet ﷺ had disliked. And it might have been very difficult for him to actually to, to handle that, loving the Prophet ﷺ so much. So that, that um, you know, I don't know if it makes sense to you, but that's something that came into my mind as well. That it's also saving them from that sensation as well of having, even if it's by accident or not, by not knowing, but having done something that may have upset the Prophet ﷺ or the Prophet ﷺ may have disliked. One, one way he did, um, did openly dislike me was he would turn his face. He would turn away, yeah. He would turn away. Often, you know, this was, he wouldn't directly criticize, he would tell the Sahaba to go and do something. Or well, if it's something immediate, sometimes the reaction was that the Prophet Allah would just turn away. And he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't look at that person or he wouldn't devote his attention to Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha, she narrates the next hadith, she says that the Messenger of Allah was not vulgar, nor did he engage himself in obscenity, and nor did he shout in the markets. He did not respond to evil with evil, but he would forgive and he would pardon. Uh, again, it shows us different glimpses of the character of the Prophet The Prophet was not vulgar. This means by nature he was not vulgar. You know, some people, and I use that word by nature cautiously because by you know nature, true nature and true fitra is Islam. It just means uh, not maybe not nature by habit. I should say by habit. Some people are vulgar by habit. You know they have a habit of blurting out obscenities and you know and loose talk and so on. And some people 
um, you know, they try to keep up with the with the company and with the gathering. So they may, by nature or by habit, they may not be vulgar, but when in the, they're in that sort of company, in order to keep face, they will engage in whatever conversation uh, sort of takes place, and so they will they will uh, include. You know, they, they, they will include their part in that conversation simply to keep face or for that reason. So the first thing that she clarifies is that neither by nature or by habit the Prophet ﷺ was not in any way vulgar and he did not even engage in any sort of obscenity, you know, even to for any other reason. So it wasn't a habit and it wasn't even something that he ever did. So basically what that is telling you is that he was never ever vulgar. Uh, it's just a, a way of emphasizing that point. Nor did he shout in the markets. Why? Because again, the market is a busy place, you know, voices are raised, different types of conversations, different types of people meeting each other. The fact of the matter was that the Prophet you know, kept to his own affairs even whilst being in the marketplace. He didn't indulge in uh, those sort of affairs and, and, and useless conversations. And why specifically the markets that if the Prophet ﷺ was so cautious about or you know, the Prophet ﷺ's habit was that he did not indulge in such conversations in the marketplaces then you can't imagine anything like that happening in the gathering of Rasulullah ﷺ. So again it's a, it's, a, it's a form of emphasis to show that he never did anything like that. He did not respond to evil with evil. The Prophet Sallallahu response was always, always better and he would forgive and pardon. I just want to give you one example um, of this forgiving and pardoning um, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In some of, in the previous texts, there were some, you know, there, there were descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, very, very detailed descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His conduct and his characteristics were described in detail, even. And a couple of his characteristics that were described in previous texts, um, you know, divine uh, sort of texts, or were two of them were one was that his mercy would be greater than his anger. So his mercy, his kindness would be greater than his anger. The second one was that the more difficult someone became, the more rude someone became, the more obnoxious someone became, the greater the Prophet ﷺ's hell, his, you know, his, his forbearance would become. He would, you know, so that if someone, the more vulgar that someone became, the more forbearing the Prophet ﷺ became towards him. And so, this is, this hadith is with reference to those two qualities of the Prophet Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala was in this um, gathering in which a person came, a Bedouin, he came to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I accepted Islam. I went back to my uh, sort of uh, clan and I encouraged them to accept Islam as well. And one of the things that I said to him when I encouraged them to accept Islam was if you accept Islam, Allah will give you more sustenance. You know, Allah, He's the provider, He's the Razik, and He will increase your risk and your sustenance. And so, however, for you know, for such a for such a, a time, we've been suffering a drought, and they're actually struggling now. And I fear that they might turn back on their religion, because this was one of the things that I said to them. And I've come to you to ask you for help. You know, if you can help us in some way, then uh, you know maybe this will help to strengthen their iman and to help them with their iman. Just uh, to hint, uh, drop a hint that you know again. Notice how the companions coming with questions and for seeking help from the Prophet وسلم, in all different departments. And so the Prophet وسلم, at that time did not physically have anything to give to that man. But so he said to Sayyidina Ali Allah Ta'ala that uh, go to such and such uh, a person um, and get, you know, borrow some money from him and give it to this person. And so 
when the Prophet asked Sayyidina Ali, he asked him initially, he said, have you got anything to give him? He came back and he said, no, no, there isn't anything actually there to give him physically. And so, at this point, um, you know, Sayyidina Zaid radiallahu ta'ala, who was at that time, he was one of the senior ulama amongst the Jews. He was a Jewish alim, a Jewish scholar, who was present, who was watching and listening to this gathering. Um, when the Prophet وسلم, said to Sayyidina Ali ta'ala about borrowing, he came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, well, he, he, he talked to the Prophet وسلم, about a specific orchard in Medina. He said, if you promise me that by such a date, you will give me X amount of dates from that particular orchard, I will give you this much money. Basically, he was offering to loan the Prophet uh, money so that he could give to help to help these people. If in return the Prophet ﷺ promised that on such, you know, such, by such a date, the Prophet ﷺ would give him this amount of dates from that orchard. And the Prophet ﷺ then in return he, he replied, he said, What you're asking is difficult. I you know, I don't want to restrict it to a specific orchard. If you open it up to any orchard and just say this amount of dates, I will accept what you're offering. And so he agreed, and so he gave that amount of money to the Prophet and he then gave it to this person. He said, Go, go and help your family and you know do whatever you need to do with it. But he advised him, he said, be just and be fair. You know, as he was leaving, these were the words of the Prophet, be just and be fair. And he gave him the money, he said, Go and help your family. And he promised this man that by this date I will give you this amount of dates. As it so happens, when there were only when there were a few days left before the actual date that had been agreed, a few days before this, deliberately, this person, Sayyidina Zaid, ta'ala, he came. Remember, he's still a Jew, he's not accepted Islam, and he's one of their ulama, he's one of their scholars well versed in their texts. And he's trialing these two qualities of the Prophet. Because he thought to himself, he'd, he'd read all about the Prophet and he'd seen everything else that had been mentioned in the texts, he'd seen it in the Prophet except he'd not, actually, he'd not witnessed these two characteristics. So he set up this whole thing to actually test these characteristics. And so he came to the Prophet deliberately, he came early, before the date, when the Prophet was not actually liable to pay him back yet. He came and he grabbed hold of the Prophet from here grabbed him and he said, O oh, Muhammad, he said, you know, I want I want my dates right now. And I know you people, you you know, children of Abdul Muttalib, you're all like this. You take things and you basically he went on quite a bit and he insulted the Prophet, grabbing hold of him from uh, from his collar from here. And so the Prophet uh, simply smiled. However, Sayyidina Umar ta'ala was in that gathering. <laughs> from that response, I, I understand that you, you, you understand what the response from him would have been. He said to avoid. <laughs> Enemy of Allah. Why are you behaving in this manner? Had it not been for fear of upsetting the Prophet wasallam, I would take your head off your body. <laughs> And the Prophet ﷺ smiled and this is the conduct and character of the Prophet ﷺ. forgiveness and forbearance is what we're talking about. He said to Sayyidina Umar, he said, I didn't expect this from you. What I expect from you, also teaching as well, he said, what I expect from you and what is better from you is that you tell me to give what I owe and do it. Uh, you know, in a good manner, and you should tell him to ask in a more, uh, you know, in a better manner. So you should be advising us both. You should be advising me to give what I owe, and you should be advising him to ask in a better manner. And so he sent Sayyidina Umar. He said, "You go and go and give this man what he owes, what what he's owed." Mm -hmm. And so uh, Sayyidina Umar of the Allah Taala. He went with this person and he actually said to Sayyidina Umar, he said, give him what he's owed and on top of that, because of your telling him off, because you told him off and you had a go at him, 
give him an extra 20 sa of dates and a sa is uh, it's equivalent to maybe about 4 kilograms or maybe about 80 kilograms quite an excessive amount of dates Prophet said to him give him an extra 20 sa because, of, because you had a boy and so Sayyidina Umar he went he gave this person what he was owed on the way back Sayyidina Zayd he spoke to Sayyidina Umar he said, he said don't you recognize me he said, no. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm such and such a person. And uh, Sayyidina Umar he said, right, okay, I, so you are one of the ulama of the Yahud. You're one of their scholars. And he said, yes. He said, I, well, I would have, you know, you're, you're an alim. Even though, you know, you're an alim of the Yahud, you're an alim. You're, you're a scholar. I would expect from such a person better behavior. And so then he, he told him what the deal was. He said, I had witnessed all the signs that have been mentioned of the last Prophet and Messenger in our text. I would already seen them in the Prophet as well. There was only two that I hadn't physically witnessed myself. One was that his patience would be greater than his anger. You know, his, or his, his, uh, sort of his kindness will be greater than his anger. And the second one, that the more rude somebody becomes, the greater his patience and forbearance will become. And he said, I, you know, I used this as a means to test these two qualities of the Prophet And he said, I want you to be my witness that I am now accepting Islam and becoming a Muslim. And he said, half of everything that I own, I, I, give, to the, I give in the way of Allah as charity among, to be distributed amongst the Muslims. I don't, I don't want any of this. So, uh, and so he remained Muslim and then he participated in, in all the battles that uh, took place after that as well. And he was, coincidentally, he was martyred in the Battle of Tabuk. And so um, that's something that Mullah Al Qari he mentions in his commentary of the Shamayl here, where he talks about, the, where you can see the Aisha mentions the forgiveness and the forbearance and the pardon of the Prophet's love. Can I just ask, you know, is it an attribute of the Prophet to have, well, women that support him, because you are allowed to um, seek retribution hmm. as a Muslim, but the Prophet did he always have to forgive? He didn't have to, okay. but this was his nature, this was uh, something that the Prophet yes. was bestowed with in his nature. Okay. His nature was so that... Not in that sense, no. It, you know, the fact is that Allah Subhanahu wa did send him as rahmatul alamin or mercy for the entire creation. But again, that's part of his his khalq, his creation, and his nature was that it was so. Which is why, and it was intended that he was so, uh, because it's mentioned in the previous texts about him. You know, one of his names, uh, which inshallah, hopefully if we can uh, include the chapter on the names. One of his names was Nabi al Rahma the Prophet of Mercy. This is how he was described in previous texts. Moving on, Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrates the next hadith also. She says that the Messenger of Allah did not strike anything with his blessed hand except in the way of Allah. He never struck a slave or a woman. So there we see that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never struck anybody uh, unless it was in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we see uh, examples of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's sort of forgiveness rather than you know uh, his retribution. And the next hadith also narrated by Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that I never saw the Messenger of Allah take revenge for an injustice that was done upon him personally, that was linked to his person, so long as the prohibitions of Allah were not transgressed. However, when an individual transgressed against that which Allah prohibited, he would become the most angry of people. That's something else I mentioned previously. He was not given the choice between two matters except that he picked the easier of the two so long as it did not lead towards any sin. So if he ever had a choice between two things, he would always pick the easier one as long as it wasn't something that was leading away from the Sharia. So this hadith also, it talks about the Prophet not taking revenge. 
During the Battle of Uhud, as you know, the Prophet ﷺ was physically injured. Uh, he, he bled from his cheek, his teeth were chipped, and the, the Sahaba, they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they requested, they said, Ya Rasulullah, pray against this person who's injured you, or pray against the Kufa. And the Prophet ﷺ refused. He said, no. And he prayed to Allah. His prayer was, oh Allah, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know, they are unaware of what they're doing. They, they are not yet aware that I am truly, you know, they're not truly aware that I am the messenger of Allah. And they are not aware of the transgression that they are committing. And even at such a, a time, the Prophet ﷺ, this was the prayer that the Prophet ﷺ adopted. And also, it's mentioned within that, that, um, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, given the choice between two matters, he would pick the easier of the two. Basically, you know, um, the, the Prophet ﷺ would look at, because he was an example for his ummah to follow, you know, he was, you know, he's our main example. And so the Prophet ﷺ, whenever given a choice, he would choose the easier of the two for the benefit of his ummah. Why? Because after him, we are then to follow his example. He, you know, for the Prophet ﷺ, it wasn't a matter of ease and comfort. You know, he was someone who spent his nights worshipping Allah, standing where his feet became swollen and began to bleed. And this did not concern him. But for the sake of the ummah, he would always choose the easier option so that it was easier to follow for the ummah. Provided that it was something that obviously did not lead uh, to anything outside the confines of the Sharia. The next hadith, Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrates that a, a man sought permission from the Messenger of Allah to enter his presence whilst I was with him. So she was sitting with the Prophet while, when this man came. She says that the Prophet before he entered, before giving permission for him to enter, he said how wretched of a man he is amongst his community. Prophet mentioned that he's not a very good person. He's actually uh, he's a wretched person within his community. He granted him permission to enter, but then he spoke to him very softly, very gently. When he left, I said, Sayyid Aisha says that I asked the Prophet, I said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you said what you did. You know, in other words, that you said that he was a wretched man, and yet you spoke to him so softly, you know, and uh, uh, and gently. And the Prophet ﷺ replied, he said, O Aisha, indeed from the worst of people are those who people disregard because of their harsh speech. Harsh or obscene or foul speech. So they are the worst of people. People stop talking to them, people leave them simply because they know that when they speak to them, they will be... Uh, hurling insults or they will be speaking harshly or uh, you know are hurling obscenities at them and so one important very very important thing which immediately comes to mind and obviously we always need to clarify these kind of doubts for the safety of our own aqidah and our iman is the fact that you know someone may question that was this not ribat was this not backbiting no it wasn't one of the main rules regarding backbiting is that if you are doing something to safeguard someone else from the from the evil of another person, this is not backbiting. Right? For example, you know that this person could cause harm to somebody, and you warn them, you say, be careful of this person, he may cause you this harm. This is not but this is not backbiting, you're trying to save them from coming to harm from that person. So in, on that level, it's not backbiting anyway. What harm? Could this have caused? Well, it was evident because Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked. Right? The way the Prophet you know, what this tells you is that even with the most evil of people, the Prophet wasallam's manner was gentle. Right? This is something that I, I mentioned to one of my students uh, recently. He was asking about you know, uh, how to address uh, a, a non-Muslim regarding an issue which is not mutual between us. Like, you know, for example, uh, the example he gave was then consuming pork. And you know the, what he mentioned was was a very difficult and harsh way of addressing the issue. And I said no. I said you need to address it in a you know if you're gonna if you're gonna offend somebody, that person's never gonna listen to you again. Don't say something immediately that's gonna cause him offence. Be wise. 
choose your words. And this was the way of the Prophet So he spoke to him gently. Now, what did we what did we mention coincidentally right at the very beginning of that chapter that, that, that uh, the Sahabi who asked the Prophet you know, am I better than Abu Bakr? You know, what, what was his statement? Because of the Prophet devoting his attention to him to that degree, he felt that he was the best of people. This was the nature of the Prophet This man, had the Prophet addressed him in the same manner, it was possible that Sayyidah Aisha anha would have assumed that he, this is someone very important, very special, or is a very good person. And she may, you know, there may have been things said in front of him which really shouldn't have. Or that, you know, she may have then, this may have become a source of him becoming trustworthy when he actually wasn't. And so it was important for the Prophet ﷺ to mention this before so that, you know, people could remain uh, free from any, coming to any harm from this person. As a warning. As a, as a warning, yeah. Because the way that the Prophet spoke to him was likely to give a different impression. Yeah. And then someone may have uh, sort of come to harm from him because of that, because of believing that he's a, a noble and honorable, sort of upstanding sort of a, a person. Can I, I don't understand, but I don't understand what the Prophet does now said. Um, why he's said that he's He's the, you know, he's the worst of people. The worst of people are those who people disregard. So yeah, I'm coming to that. Uh, I'm coming to that now. We were talking about the previous statement before, why he warned about that person. What he said at the end was, there's two possibilities, that the Prophet uh, was talking about himself, saying that, you know, the worst of, of people is he who people fear his speech. And so I don't speak like that. I, you know, and so he was talking about his own speech, that I don't want to be one of those people. Or the possibility is that he was, because he was a wretched person, the Prophet ﷺ addressed him gently so that he would not become obscene and he would not say anything like that. But there's, so two, there's two implications there, either. Soften, soften the person that he was addressing as well. well, yeah, obviously, you know, the, well, the effect that it has is, 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 is different. Part of the, uh, you know, the, the nature of the Prophet ﷺ, his khuluq was one of his greatest. Uh, sort of attributes in terms of da'wah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that, that would be a separate effect that it, it may well have had on that person. But this was, you know, this is one of the possibilities, I think. See, the Hassan bin Ali, he mentions uh, part of that same hadith again from his uncle, that description of the Prophet. And this is a really, really long hadith, it? it's a really long description. What Imam Tirmazi has done in the Shamail is that he's taken portions which are relevant to each chapter and he split it up into different portions and he's put the relevant portion with the relevant chapter. So in other books you will find the whole hadith, hadith consecutively you know, told in its entirety. This is part of that same hadith. Imam Hussain he says that I asked my father regarding the conduct of the Prophet in his gatherings. He said the Messenger of Allah, I'm just going to read through this, it's not a great deal of commentary but it's very beautiful how that is, how the, what the description of the gathering of the Prophet was. The Messenger of Allah was always smiling. He had a soft character and was always one to pardon. We've seen examples of that before. He never adopted poor characteristics, nor was he ever harsh. We were just mentioning that about the speech of the Prophet. Nor did he ever shout. Again, something that we already discussed. Nor was he ever obscene, nor did he seek one's fault, nor did he engage in futile arguments. He would turn his attention away when he would hear or see something that did not please him. He would not dishearten an individual when he would ask him of something. By dishearten, it means here the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked for help, did not say no. He didn't say no. And this is why you know, there's a very famous part of Imam Ahmad Raga, a famous uh, couplet. Uh, beginning of that naat is actually very, very famous. Shahibat Hatira, you know, addressing the Prophet, he says, Oh, King of Taiba or Batha, or Madina Munawara, your sort of your, uh, your giving and your generosity is, is so huge, how amazing it is. Nahi, Sunta hi nahi, Maagne wala tera. Someone who comes to seek from you never hears the word no. You never say no. And so, um, 
this, that, that's something that's mentioned there as well, that he would not dishearten an individual when he would ask him of something, that he, that, that um, sorry, that, that, that's what we mentioned in a moment. This is actually talking about that if someone asked a question that wasn't maybe entirely appropriate, the Prophet ﷺ would not dishearten an individual when he would ask him of something that did not please him, nor did he promise to fulfill anything for him. He would not occupy himself with three things. So these things he avoided: argument, uh, argumentation, or arguing, um, excessiveness in uh, money and speech, and that which did not involve him. So he remained clear of affairs that weren't, uh, that didn't concern him. When it came to people, he would not involve himself in three things. He would not debase anyone. He would not seek out anyone's faults, and he would not seek out anyone's. Secrets. He wouldn't uh, sort of uh, seek out anything secret about that person. He would not speak except that speech would invoke rewards. What he, when he would speak, his words would make those sitting lower their heads in such a manner that if a bird were perched upon them, they would, uh, you know, they were sitting. At, this is a very beautiful description of the gathering of the Majlis of Rasulullah It shows you how the Sahaba sat in front of the Prophet This is the respect that they gave to the Prophet When they were sat in his presence, they sat as if they had birds perched on their heads Heads lowered and so still that it would seem, you know, that the reason that, that metaphor is very very apt because if you have a bird sitting somewhere, even the slightest of movement will cause it to fly away. They sat as if they had a bird perched on their heads, with their heads lowered and absolutely still. They would only begin to speak after he had gone silent. They would never interject. And they would not argue anything with him. They wouldn't answer back or ask you know, excessive questions about something. They would remain silent while someone was speaking to him. And they would all speak in order. So no two people would begin speaking at the same time. Now, uh, it, it seems that this gathering was completely serene and so beautiful. Um, he would laugh at whatever they laughed at and he would be surprised at whatever they were surprised at. He would have patience with the stranger that would come to him with poor manners. And here I just want to mention again another reference, uh, uh, quite a famous hadith where a, a Bedouin, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ at that time had a shawl around his neck. This shawl had uh, something, you know, had a, a, a coarse border around it. And so when he, he grabbed the Prophet ﷺ from here and shook him very violently, so much that the Sahaba say that the, his, by grabbing the Prophet ﷺ, it left an imprint around his, his neck of, you know, of that shawl. This is how violently he shook the Prophet and the way he addressed the Prophet He said, O oh Muhammad, give me of the wealth that Allah has given you. It's not yours or your father's that you, you give, it's from Allah. This is how he addressed him. It doesn't belong to you or your father. It is Allah's that is given to you. Give me some from it. The Prophet asked him, he said, what if you were to be reproached for what you've done? Now, the way you've addressed me, what if you were to be reproached for that? He said, I don't fear for that. Because I know that you never respond to evil or you never respond to anything that is uh, bad with something equally as bad. You always respond with something good. I have no fear of that. And so the Prophet ﷺ instructed, he had two camels with him, for one of them to be loaded with grain and for the other one to be loaded with dates. This is how the Prophet is going to behave. So he would not, if a stranger came to him with poor manners, who was crude in the manner in which he spoke and the manner in which he asked questions, he would, you know, he would not, he would be patient. To the extent that his companions would bring outsiders to his gatherings, as he said, when you see someone who has a need, seek him out and grant him support. He would not accept praise except when it was upon a bounty of Allah that occurred upon his blessed hands, that someone had received a blessing of Allah through him. Other than that, he wouldn't allow praise. Again, this was setting a precedent, setting an example. Unfortunately, you know, we see completely the opposite happening today. You know, um, titles which are completely unjustified. 
and you know, praise which is completely unjustified, happily being accepted. He would not cut anyone off whilst they were speaking, unless when it was permissible for him to cut them off. Then he would prohibit them from speaking, or stand up, or leave. So if, if the conversation was not to his liking, this was how he sort of uh, dealt with it. So that's a very beautiful, very clear description, not really a great deal to comment on with that. Sayyidina Jabir bin Abdullah he says that this is what I was talking about before, about never saying no. The Messenger of Allah was never asked for something and he said no. Never asked for something and he said no. And there's a very beautiful hadith which will, uh, will, I'll talk about that when it comes, which is very closely related to this one, that he would never say no. Next to this narrated by Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas who says that the Messenger of Allah was the most generous of people in good. The most generous of people. He was the most generous of people, especially in Ramadan. And until the end of Ramadan. So throughout the whole month of Ramadan, the Prophet was exceptionally generous. Jibreel al Islam came to him in this month and the Quran was revealed in this month. When Jibreel al Islam met him, the Messenger of Allah was more generous than in good than a wind that brings forth rain. You know, what it means is that, you know, more generous than heavy sort of uh, and very fast wind, that when, when the Prophet had something, it went quicker than it came. You know, and he had it distributed amongst Sahaba. He wouldn't actually sort of, uh, he wouldn't sit there and sort of, uh, he wouldn't sit on that wealth. And it, it never happened. On one occasion, it's actually narrated that uh, the Prophet ﷺ, it's, uh, it's narrated by Imam Timzi himself or in another, uh, regarding a different occasion that the Prophet ﷺ was given 90,000 dirham. That's quite an excessive amount of silver, 90,000 dirham. And the Prophet ﷺ uh, put them down, uh, you know, basically put them on a, uh, in front of him on a mat and uh, he stood there and watched them being taken until they were all gone. This is how, this is the Prophet generosity. That's why it's described like a wind. You know? And so, uh, there's something that's also going to be mentioned in another hadith about the Prophet and how he gave. Sayyidina Anas bin Malik says that the Prophet would not store anything for the following day. This is something that's come up before. The Prophet ﷺ, you know, why? Because it was tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, he would, uh, he would give it away immediately. And, you know, anything that was left, he wouldn't save it for the following day. Why? Because if Allah provided today, he would provide tomorrow as well. And for that day, he would distribute that amongst those who were in need. This was a habit of the Prophet ﷺ. Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala, he narrates, and this is the hadith that I was mentioning before, that the Prophet never said no. You'll see a glimpse of this in this hadith. A man came to the Prophet and asked the Messenger of Allah that he give him something. The Prophet said, I don't have anything to give at this moment. Everything's gone, it's finished. But the Prophet said to him, he never said no. Then turn him away. He said, go to such and such a person, go and borrow the money of him, and I will pay it back to him. You don't need to pay back to him. Go and borrow it from him and I will pay that back to him. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu he was stood there. He said to the Prophet sallallahu he said, Ya Rasulullah, if you don't physically have something to give, then, you know, obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is not making you, you know, you are not obliged to give something to someone when you physically don't have anything to give. Why do you take it upon yourself to actually go into debt and to borrow from people and give to others. And the Prophet ﷺ became upset at this. At this remark, the Prophet ﷺ became upset and he disliked what Sayyidina Umar said. And then another person from amongst the Ansar, from the residents of Medina, he was also present. He was watching, he noticed that the Prophet ﷺ was upset by what Sayyidina Umar said. So he then said, he said, O Messenger of Allah, spend as much as you want. Give as much as you want to whomever you want and do not fear 
any limitation from the possessor of the divine throne. Right? Don't fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not sort of uh, will, will not uh, take care of you. Give whatever you wish to whomever you want. Why all of this? Spending on others, helping others, not for himself. And so this made the messenger of Allah smile. When he said this, the Prophet began to smile and joy could be seen on his blessed face because of what the Ansari had said. The messenger of Allah said, this is what I have been instructed to do. Not what Sayyidina Umar was saying. He replied to Sayyidina Umar by saying, this is what I have been instructed. This is what I have been ordered. And so a very beautiful example of how the Prophet never actually said no. And there's something uh, here regarding Sayyidina Bilal that's mentioned as well. That Sayyidina Bilal narrates this about the Prophet He mentions this attribute to the Prophet And he says that it was my job to actually give when people came to ask. The Prophet would send me, would say, go and give him so and so. And so whenever there was nothing there, the Prophet sent me to go and borrow money to give to them. And he says that I met one person who said to me, he was from amongst the polities, he said, you know what, if you need to borrow money, just come to me, don't go to anyone else. So I started borrowing from him, but after a while, after a few months, this person came to me, even before the time, and he said, he grabbed me, and he said, what date is it? How many days left in this month? And Sayyidina Bilal said, you know, just a few days, it's the end of the month. He said, by the end of this month, if you do not pay me back in full, I will make you my slave. You will become a slave again, the way you were before, before you were bought by the Prophet. And so Sayyidina Bilal came to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is, this is what's happened. This person is going, to, is going to humiliate me. And you don't physically, there isn't anything there in the, you know, that we can pay him back with. Should I go into hiding? You know, I don't want to be humiliated by this person. And the Prophet said, no. He said, wait. And then by nightfall, the Prophet called Sayyidina Bilal. When he came, there were, two, there were a few camels there with provisions on them. And he said, Go and take this and go and pay him off. And so the Prophet ﷺ handled you know, that affair in that, that manner. And however, when he went and paid him off, he came back and there was still some there was still some left. And so the Prophet said he said, Go and distribute this amongst the people. And because it was late, it was maybe close to the evening, not many people came, so he wasn't able to distribute it all on that night. That night, the Prophet ﷺ did not go home. He slept in the masjid. He slept in the masjid. The following day, when all of it had been distributed, the following day, the next night, the Prophet ﷺ went home and slept at home. He didn't want to sleep at home. Why? Because he didn't want to have that in his home or in his possession overnight. He waited for it to be distributed. The next of these, it narrated that... Uh, Someone came to the Prophet ﷺ, a young girl coming to the Prophet ﷺ with a tray of fresh dates and with some cucumbers. You heard this in the chapter of the food. She came, the Prophet ﷺ just grabbed hold of a handful of jewellery and gave it to her. Not measuring how much it was, not seeing what it was, not seeing what value it was. This is one, also one of the habits of the Prophet ﷺ. He would receive gifts, he would always return the gifts as well. And in some narrations actually mentioned that he would return them in a better manner. That's the next hadith. The next hadith is that the Prophet would accept gifts and present them in return. And in a different wording of the same hadith, it says that he would give a better gift in return. Look at that. I, but, and I have seen, you know, we see amongst the Sufiyah and amongst the ulama and scholars and so on. The Prophet had all of these characteristics, all of them together in his person. It is not anyone's ability to be able to match the qualities of the Prophet And so we see glimpses of these qualities within the ulama, within the Sufiya. And so some we find have you know, very uh, prominent generosity. 
others you know very gentle in their speech and others something you know we see that their nature is focused around one attribute of the prophet sallallahu and i've seen people like this you know, i've seen someone who's come you know a, a travelers come i've literally seen uh, people ulama you know and i've seen sufia who've put their hand in their pocket not seen whether it's a you know it's a 10 pound note or a 50 pound note or how many there are just literally put his hand in his pocket and give it to that person as a gift, as a parting gift. Um, but this is something that follows through. The next couple of chapters are very short. There's only a couple of ahadith each in those chapters. And so um, I'm going to continue on. The next chapter is that which is narrated regarding the modesty of the Prophet ﷺ. And there's two ahadith which are narrated in this chapter. Modesty is a very, very important attribute. Why is it important? The Prophet said, when you have no shame, when you have no haya, do as you please. What does that mean? Literally means if I was to be crude in an example, you getting up and clothing yourself. Why not walking out sort of uh, completely unclothed? What stops you from doing that? That sensation inside you that this is wrong. This is what haya is. And there's different forms of haya. You know, and haya is simply not making something apparent which shouldn't be. And so that's quite a crude example, but it, you know, as alarming as it, is, as it is, it has the effect that I want it to have. But this is what it means when you have no haya, do as you please. Do what you want then. And so it's very, very important. And this was a prominent feature within the Prophet Wasallam's attributes. He was the most modest of people, more so than an unmarried girl in her, you know, uh, in her quarters. And when he would dislike something, it would be seen in his blessed face. His discomfort could be seen, his anger could be seen, his joy, everything simply noticed by the Sahaba through his expressions didn't have to verbally say something. This is the haya, extent of the haya of the Prophet that when he disliked something, simply walked away, simply turned away, or his facial expressions uh, told people. See, the Aisha Allah, she says, I never ever saw the satr of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and neither did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam see my satr. Again, this is the haya and modesty, in spite of you know being husband and wife, and yet this never happened. This was the modesty of the Prophet If this was his modesty amongst his, you know, with his wife or at home, then imagine how modest the Prophet was um, so publicly. So an extremely important quality. I can't, uh, sort of, you know, I can't say how not, how important this pro, uh, quality actually is. The next chapter is regarding cupping, and again, this is something beneficial. It's been narrated. Uh, from the Prophet ﷺ that this is beneficial and this should be done. See, the Anas bin Malik he says that we asked regarding the income of someone who does cupping. Because remember, in that time it was done, it was administered orally. Someone actually would uh, make uh, an incision and would uh, suck out the, the blood and then spit it out. This was done orally. And uh, the Messenger of Allah would have. Uh, it, Sayyidina Anas bin Malik was asked whether it's permissible to take money for, do, for doing cupping or not. And he narrated that the hadith of the Prophet saying that the Messenger of Allah would have cupping administered upon him by Abu Taiba. He ordered that he be given two measures of food and that the Messenger of Allah spoke to his masters. So he was a slave. He spoke to his masters and asked that his labor tax be lightened. He was a specific, there's different categories within slaves. His category was that he was given permission to do what he wanted by his owners. But he had to give a daily amount to them. And anything on top of that that he earned was his. But he would have to pay this minimum amount. And it's narrated that originally his agreement was three sa per day. And the Prophet spoke to them and had it lowered to two sa. So one third of his burden per day was lowered by the Prophet. And the Prophet actually then said, that indeed the best of what you can cure with is cupping. It's a cure to a lot of illnesses. 
And so that tells us that cupping, number one, is permissible, is beneficial, and secondly, that someone may take, uh, may earn a living off, you know, cupping. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, he says that uh, the Prophet had cupping administered upon himself and he ordered that I give the copper his fee, thus I gave him his fee. So the same thing proven from that hadith as well. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu, he narrates that the Prophet had cupping administered on both sides of his blessed neck and between his shoulders. He gave the copper, you know, the person who was doing it, his fee. Had it been impermissible, he would not have given this fee. So he actually explicitly explains that hadith himself, Abdullah bin Abbas. He says that if it wasn't permissible, the Prophet wouldn't have done it. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar, he says that the Prophet called someone for cupping. He came and administered the cupping upon the Messenger of Allah and he asked him, what is your labor tax? He replied, three measures. Thus the Messenger of Allah had it brought down to uh, one measure. But, and some people say that this is the same Abu Daiba that's mentioned in the previous one. Sayyidina Anas bin Malik relates that the Messenger of Allah would have cupping administered upon both sides of his blessed neck and the upper part of his back and he would have it admi administered on the 17th, 19th and the 21st. It is actually mentioned by some uh, traditional medics as well that cupping should be done around the middle of the month and not at the start or the end. Sayyidina Anas bin Malik relates that the Messenger of Allah had cupping administered upon the top of his blessed foot whilst he was in the state of Ihram and this is the reason why, according to the Hanafi Mazhab, you are permitted to have cupping done whilst you are in the ihram, state of the ihram, as long as you don't uh, violate any other conditions of the ihram, like, for example, breaking a hair, you know, if it doesn't break or if it doesn't pluck out the hair. And so that talks about the cupping of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and and the, the benefits and the fact that it is permissible for someone to actually. Uh, earn money for that purpose. One of the reasons why it mentions, you know, the Prophet Islam's, one of the reasonings that some of the ulama have mentioned for the Prophet Islam, having the cupping done frequently and on different parts of the body is actually that this took place after uh, the conquest of Khaybar, where the Prophet ﷺ was tried to be, someone tried to poison the Prophet ﷺ with poisoned meat. And because he'd eaten a very small amount and then the meat spoke to him and told him that it was poisoned, whatever amount he had eaten, that would circulate through his blood and when it caused him discomfort, the Prophet ﷺ would have the cupping done and from different sort of parts of the body, whatever was being affected at that time. So it's not to be done like prophylactically and to prevent Things, but in response to it can be, it doesn't need to be a responsive measure, it can be preventative as well, you know, the barakas or whatever the Prophet has instructed has been mentioned. However, there is actually some detail that medics uh, mention, there's two different types of cupping, there's hijama and there's fasad. Hijama is uh, lacerations at the exterior and fasad is more the blood that is drawn from the veins and stuff. And it's actually recommended, fasad is what's recommended by the medics for people living in colder climates and hijama is recommended for people living in warmer climates like the Arab climate. There is some, a bit of detail into that but that's more of a medical issue so I'm not going to uh, go into more detail than that. Finally, the last chapter, there's two ahadith in this chapter as well. This is regarding the names of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet was referred to by many different names. And excessive names is actually denotes huge status. Why? Because these names were based on the qualities of the Prophet. ﷺ. Imagine if he had a thousand names. You know, that means he's got a thousand you know, different beautiful qualities that are being mentioned in those names. So more names means generally a higher status. And the Prophet ﷺ literally did have uh, thousands of names. You know, uh, Imam in, in a uh, in a commentary of Tirmidhi, uh, it's mentioned that there are uh, 1,000 names have been mentioned by Imam Ibn al-Arabi of the Prophet, 1,000 names. And uh, Imam Jalal al-Din Sayyuti, rahimahullah, he's written a whole book just about the names of the Prophet So in this one, the first of these narrated by Jubair in Mut'im, and he says that the Messenger of Allah said, I have numerous names. I am Muhammad. I am Ahmad, I am Al-Mahi, I 
by whom Allah obliterated disbelief. But that's what Allahi means. Obliterated. So Allah obliterated disbelief through me. I am Al-Hashir, upon whose feet mankind will be resurrected. So the first to be resurrected. That's what Al-Hashir means. And I am Al-Aqib, after whom there is no prophet. Aqib means the one who comes after everyone else. So I am the last of the prophet. The prophet explained these names himself as well. <coughs> Muhammad, this is a name which was reserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the creation solely for the Prophet How amazing is that? And Muhammad means someone who's praised again and again and again continuously and endlessly. The Prophet is praised. And why would this not be when Allah himself praises the Prophet And he's the first of creation. Now all of those things tie in very beautifully. Ahmad means one who praises the most. Why wouldn't he be? When he was first created, his nur remained in different stages, praising Allah for thousands of years before anything else was created. So why wouldn't he be the one who praises the most? Sayyidina Huzayfa, he says, I met the Prophet in some of the blessed streets of Medina. He said, I am Muhammad, I am Ahmad, I am Nabi Rahma, I am the Prophet of Mercy, I am Nabi Tawbah, I am the Prophet of Tawbah, I am Al Muqaffa. And I am Al Hashir and I am Al Nabi Al Malahim. So, all of these names of the Prophet have been mentioned here. Now, among of these names, firstly, Nabi Al Rahma. You know, I've explained Muhammad and Ahmad. Nabi Al Rahma, the Prophet of Mercy. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wama illa He's a mercy for the entire creation. For the believers, it's evident. I don't need to mention why. For the disbelievers, even they benefit from the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ. That collective punishments have been stopped by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even they benefit and they get time to repent. And Nabi Tawbah, the Prophet of Repentance. Why the Prophet of Repentance? Because we, believe it or not, this is something that we benefit from the, for the sake of the Prophet ﷺ. Whereas previous nations, in order to have their tawbah accepted, they would sometimes have to give their life, that was their tawbah, to offer themselves up to be, uh, to be killed. And capital punishment, this was their tawbah. This has been lifted from this home. All you do is you sincerely repent to Allah, and Allah forgives if you are sincere. Unless it's actually you know, a capital offense. Um, and second, uh, thirdly, the Prophet wasallam, he says, I am al mukaffa and this means that there will be no the one who comes last. So there's no other prophets after the Prophet Al Hashir already explained, and Nabi Al Malahim. You know, there's different uh, interpretations of Al Malahim. You know, um, the, pro, uh, the the one who embodies this is the Prophet Sallallahu name Al Malahim. It's the title of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it actually. It is in reference to the Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam's sort of you know being uh, his, his 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 military role as leader of the military. It, 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 there's some reference to that, and in other sort of commentaries and uh, other views that the ulama have taken is that it is it means uh, it means collectiveness, and that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's ummah will in general remain uh, a collective. Uh, you know, even now, look, after 1400 years, the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Sawadul Azam, the greatest portion of, you know, of the Ummah, and remains uh, a collective. And so, in some commentaries, it, 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 it was mentioned that. And that's the conclusion uh, of, of that particular chapter. Zakallah, thank you for listening. I know we have gone slightly over uh, the allocated time. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina mulana Muhammad wa ala ala sayyidina mulana Muhammad wa ala ala sallim. Salatu wa salam alayhi ya sayyidi ya rasulullah wa ala alika wa sahabi ya sayyidi ya habibullah. Allahumma rabbana tukabal minna inna kamta sabiyil alim. Wa tuba alina inna kamta tawabu rahim. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayni khalqihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi jmaim bi rahmatihi.